It was Austin, who had kissed me first on that rainy day, on what seemed like ages ago. We were in his car, listening to some classics, when he stopped his car under a malfunctioned streetlight and sat in his seat in absolute silence. By now, obviously, I knew what was going through his head. Earlier, I had confessed about my crush on him. In my head, that confession made sense. We had been good friends for five years by then. As risky as that move seemed to be at that time, I assumed it was better to let him know before things could get any worse for me. Austin hadn't replied to anything. At first, he had only given a small laugh in disbelief. When I didn't laugh, he had stopped laughing and coughed twice as much as any unhealthy person would. I would have slapped his back, but we both knew they were fake coughs. Austin wanted to avoid confronting the confession. To lighten the mood, he had replied, So am I an attractive man after all? We were in his car in absolute silence. I didn't say anything for fear that I would end up scaring him. He was breathing pretty loudly when he finally began. It is my family. He had begun with that. If I did anything out of line, they would ensure I didn't get a single penny from them. And I need as much as I can. I need to finish my PhD. That sounded wrong to me. As much as I sympathized with his issue, I knew what that could mean. But to my surprise, he had turned to me and looked at me with desperate eyes. But I still want to kiss you. He had said... And when I sat there in surprise for the minutes to come, he clambered on my lap in that tight space and kissed me. There was so much passion in that kiss that one wouldn't have thought that years later we would hold resentment for each other. But we did. The seeds of it were sown the moment Austin discovered he was gay. We were young then and had kept our relationship hidden for nearly two years. Although the time that we spent together was absolutely marvelous, it was filled with dread for a younger Austin. He had his conservative family to blame for that, and I understood him completely. That was why it came as a shock to me when one day he announced that he couldn't lie to his family anymore. That was it. He had been so understanding, and at that point, all my efforts seemed to have been for naught. It was not only upsetting, but absolutely soul-shattering. No matter how much I tried to make it work, he was so afraid that he didn't budge. And at the end of it, we resented each other, so much so that standing in the same room felt like a punishment. We graduated and went our ways, and I believe that to be the end of the era. But it wasn't to go that way. Years later, when things finally started to dim down a little, we ended up joining the same university as assistant professors. Wondrously, we climbed the ranks together, and now we were part of the same college faculty. We never talked about those two years again, and silently, we each pretended that there was nothing passionate between us, but in reality, that kind of passion could never be brushed away. And that was why we were here, struggling to contain it, even though Austin pretended like he was the straightest guy in the universe. Instead of kissing and having sex, we now competed against each other. But that didn't mean I was past all those memories. We were in our mid-30s, and in a completely different setting. I was brave enough to notice similar patterns in the current setting between Austin and me. The sneaking around was the same, or at least it seemed to me. Though now that we resented each other, or at least pretended to, it was not as easy to notice. But it was not entirely difficult, not when in a crowd, Austin's eyes first searched only for mine. Not when I was still holding on to those 15 years old feelings, even if it was all in secret. And that was precisely why I was still here. Disappointed and hurt. Her name's Emily. Austin continued, his hand trembling, where he held on to his desk for dear life, unnoticed to everyone else but me, and she's soon going to be my wife. His eyes, just like any other time, found mine immediately. The ache in me was chasm deep, but that didn't mean I couldn't keep up the pretenses in front of the others. It was ridiculous to imagine we were still playing this game in our adulthood. I clenched my jaw and stood in the corner of his cabin, watching the other faculty members congratulating him. I held on to my emotions for a while, and when I could no longer do it, I rushed out of Austin's room and towards the men's washroom. I expected to spend the next half an hour locked inside one of the stalls, but then I heard the unmistakable rush of feet behind me, and even without looking back, I knew it was Austin. You're not going to be kind enough to congratulate me? He asked, sounding different than he did in front of all our beaming colleagues. 
Well, I stopped on my way. Congratulations. That's not enough, he replied. I clicked my tongue. Irritation bubbled beneath my skin. What else can I say? I won again, Felix. He insisted, not sounding confident. You are once again behind me. I have found my wife, and I am going to get married to her soon. And you're still here. I turned to him, not all put off by his words. In my anger in my younger years, I'd said worse things to him. Maybe I should marry my boyfriend. Austin looked like he was biting back his words. You have a boyfriend? He finally muttered, and his voice sounded strained and hesitant. He was biting his lip in nervousness, and it was all so obvious. I wanted to tell him how easy it would be to return to each other, but I didn't. He was probably tired of thinking about that by now. I didn't want to shame him any more than I had already done, at least not now. So you have a boyfriend, he said again. I didn't, the last one was a disaster, and I still hadn't gotten over those two years that I'd spent loving Austin in close proximity, but that didn't mean I couldn't play along. If I have, then what? He went mum. Nothing, he replied eventually. Good. Are you going to invite me to your wedding? I asked, albeit sarcastically. It would be impolite for me not to. He murmured, and a few minutes later, he was out of there. I stood in silence and watched him leave just like I had watched him leave then. It was so easy to draw the parallel. I scoffed and walked to the washroom. I didn't want to cry anymore, but I still needed to wash my face. When I walked between one of the rows, I found Austin going through one of the books. I pretended it was a surprise, but we both knew it wasn't. By now, I knew a schedule like the back of my hand. He looked up at me and immediately returned to his book. Though we both knew he was now far too distracted to actually get some reading done. My subject's grading has been done, I announced. Great, he replied. How's it going with you? They wouldn't listen unless I failed a few of them, so no. I clicked my tongue. You cannot even get them to finish their assignments? I'm not their dad. He closed the book and looked for another. But you are their professor. What do you want? He asked finally. He was carrying two heavy books in his hands. I almost asked if he needed my help, but then kept my mouth closed. You didn't show me your soon-to-be wife's picture. You don't need to. I picked up a book myself and looked around the gaps to see if anyone was listening to us. These kinds of conversations could start gossip. Do you love her? I couldn't help but ask. The question had been running through my head ever since he announced his marriage, and now I didn't think I could keep it in. It only seemed natural for me to finally ask about it. Did he love her? As far as I was aware, Austin had never mentioned a woman called Emily to any of us before. Either he had kept her to himself until now, or she had come recently to his life. Or maybe, just like any other time, it involved his family. Why do you care? He asked. I don't. I lied. I just wanted to know if you could love someone so much to actually stay for them. It was a low blow, and I was perfectly aware of that, but the words came out of my mouth on their own accord, and it seemed irrational to not just let them out. If Austin felt nothing for me, really nothing, then these words wouldn't hurt him a bit. They might bother him, but they would not hurt him. I wanted him to hurt, though. I wanted him to feel the pain he had given me. He scoffed and picked up another book. He was avoiding looking at me. Maybe the reason I left you, Felix, was because you were just not worth it. And, oh, ouch, that hurt. I didn't even know if Austin really meant that, or if he just wanted to give me a blow back. But whatever the intention might have been, it was hurtful. I didn't know how to answer to that, and so I kept my mouth shut. I suddenly had no energy to actually converse with him. In fact, if I were to be honest with myself, I both wanted to stay with him and away from him. The words had brought back those old memories where I constantly questioned myself after Austin had left me. I had cried day and night and asked myself if I was worth it. I was wallowing in self-pity so much that I didn't notice the forlorn look on Austin's face until he let out a deep-seated sigh. It was so quiet in the library that the single sound itself sounded like an emotion. Sorry, he said suddenly and quietly. That was... I didn't mean to actually say that. 
He sounded like he meant his apology. Sometimes I just say things that I shouldn't. An old problem. But did you mean that? I could hear a shuffling in the distance and kept my voice low. It was past six, and I was sure one of the staff was here to announce that the library was to be closed for the day. Felix, he said finally and looked up at me. What do you want to hear? The truth, I replied urgently and stepped close to him. I knew nothing would happen between us right now, no matter how much we thought of it. After all, we had spent the past seven years trying to outrank each other, even out of resentment and childishness. He sighed. Nothing that I say now will change anything. I shrugged. Nothing has to. I am still going to publish my 11th paper before you. He gave me a small smile. I knew it meant nothing, but it still looked genuine enough that I was immediately reminded of those early mornings when I'd see him smile just like that, sleepy and with his sleep-mused hair. It was a shame something so beautiful slipped right through my fingers. Felix, he finally said, it was just not the right time. I swallowed. In the years that we had been at this university, serving as professors, I had heard those words only twice. We had been arguing the first time that he'd said those words, and at that time I'd ask him if it would have been the right time if one of us were a woman. He'd immediately shut up and left me standing alone. I didn't want to say that again now. Right, I replied and put the book back in its place. The staff reached our row and informed us of the timing. We nodded at him, and he immediately removed himself from our presence. I looked at Austin. Well, I said, clicking my tongue, congratulations on your wedding whenever it happens. I hope you two have a good married life ahead. Why can't you get over it? Austin suddenly asked. It'll be easy. We were doing so well, and now... Have you gotten over it, Austin? He clenched his jaw. At least I know how to pretend. And what good will that do? I turned to leave. I have pretended just fine until now, and when you get married, I will end them for once and all. When Austin didn't reply, I walked out of there. I believe today's interactions with Austin were done, but I wasn't so lucky. When I walked into the parking lot to get my car, I found the battery dead. I placed my bag on the car roof and looked down at the mess. I stood akimbo and thought of all the other possibilities. I could book a cab or walk 15 minutes to the bus stand and take a bus. I was still mulling over my options when a car stopped by me. I knew it was Austin even before he spoke up. Need a ride? I sighed. I can book a cab, I replied, or take the bus. I locked the car. I can drop you, Austin offered. Your home's on my way. My home's 10 minutes away from yours. I replied. He shrugged. Same thing. I swallowed, wondering if that was a good idea, but it was past nine, and I was exhausted and hungry. I still needed to cook dinner. Sleeping on an empty stomach never bode well for me, no matter how many nights I tried it. If that's all right with you, I never would have offered it if I were uncomfortable. He unlocked the rear door. I have to pick up Emily too, so... This was a bad idea but I still made myself comfortable in the back seat. He adjusted the window and looked at me through it. If you're hungry, I have some granola bars with me. No thanks. I was not hungry. I was anxious. The closer and closer we got to the place he said Emily would be waiting for him, the more anxious and nervous I felt. When he pointed at a woman standing a few feet away from us, the situation between us felt more and more real. The very fact that this was the woman he was going to marry made me want to vomit my guts out. He was going to introduce me to her. Emily was a pretty woman and was doing a decent job. I found no spark in the way they interacted, but I was worried it was only because I was biased and jealous. She was nice, but I could not picture her with Austin at all. It felt like a disaster waiting to happen, and I felt terrible thinking that. What right had I to judge what Austin liked or didn't? We were grown up now, and our preferences and likings surely had changed over time. Who knew Austin wasn't gay, but bi? Maybe he preferred women too. When Emily left, there was absolute silence between us for the first five minutes. The tension was so thick that one could cut it with a butter knife. She seems nice, I finally said. Hmm. 
Austin replied and stopped his car. Come here. I'm not your driver. Right. I replied and eventually settled on the passenger seat. She doesn't love me. Austin said finally, she doesn't want to marry me. Emily's constantly looking for reasons to end this arrangement. An arrangement? I knew instantly their families were involved. He shrugged. She is trying to crack this interview, and if it worked out, she would break this arrangement with me, in front of our parents. He added, What about you? I wanted to ask, but didn't have the courage to, actually. The rest of the drive was silent too, but the air between us wasn't as thick with tension as it was before. I observed him through my peripheral vision, and swallowed each time I noticed the familiar details on his face that I observed years ago. He still looked youthful, but maturity seemed to add to his attractiveness. I wanted to touch him again. I wanted to see if his face felt as soft as it looked. We finally reached my home, and he stopped the car. We sat in silence for a few seconds before I muttered a small thank you, grabbed my bag from the back seat, and opened the door. Felix, he said before I could leave. He wasn't looking at me, but I could feel the nervousness wafting off him. I suddenly remembered his 20th birthday and the way we had sneaked out of his birthday party and had sex in the back seat of his parents' car. He laughed then and said it was the boldest thing he had done to defy his parents. He had been just as nervous then, but happy. I do not love her. Austin finally let out. I do not want to marry her. I didn't say anything. What he told me was good news, but I wasn't sure if that would help me or my case. What was I supposed to reply to that anyway? Are you happy to hear that? He asked. Before I could answer, he started his car and finally looked at me. Congratulations on getting your paper published. Thanks, I replied, because that was all I could think. He gave me a tight smile and drove away. Publishing my paper usually brought happiness to me, but something else seemed to have my attention these days. I had received all my colleagues' congratulations by now, and a little gift from my office as well, but I was still not satisfied. It was raining hard, and I couldn't help but want to go home and sleep it all away. But the seminar was on our shoulders, and all the faculty members were ushered into the seminar hall. Half the students seemed nervous, and the others freaked out when we settled in our chairs. By sheer chance, Austin and I sat next to each other. One of our colleagues joked and asked if we would be able to behave sitting so close to each other. Austin gave them a good-natured laugh and turned to look ahead again. We were supposed to pay attention to the students discussing their papers, but I was distracted on two sides, so my attention often drifted in and out of the seminar hall. I was sitting by the window, so on one side, I was constantly aware of the cold and wet weather outside, and how many memories I had made in the rain, with the same man who was sitting right by my side. Austin looked similarly affected. His eyes often found mine. I was sure if I did more than this, a few students would eventually catch up. I cleared my throat and asked the first question to our first presenter. This way, I could prove I wasn't distracted. It felt as pathetic as it sounded. Before the first batch of the students could be finished, one of the staff members informed me that I'd left my car door open. He asked if he could grab my car keys and lock it. I found Austin's keys and told the staff member that I'd do it myself. The first batch was about to be finished anyway. I was not missing a lot. I moved myself from the hall and walked out of there. I took a long breath before I rushed towards the parking lot without an umbrella. By the time I reached there, I was wet and cursing the whole design. It was stupid of me to park my car away from the building. I was still checking for my things when I heard footsteps behind me. I turned to find Austin standing there, just as wet as me. I swallowed at the rush of memories that this sight brought to me. The very fact that so much was happening now was stupid. In the last seven years that we worked here as colleagues, we'd managed to keep it all controlled. But his announcement about his marriage with a woman seemed to open the floodgates. It was kind of unimaginable that we never managed to keep away from each other. When Austin came closer, I was feeling so many conflicting emotions that I really couldn't keep track of them, but it was new for me. Oftentimes, whenever it came to Austin, I felt conflicting emotions and a messy train of thoughts. It was almost as if I didn't know what to feel about him being so near me. Can you stop tormenting me? He asked. A mask of confusion etched my face. 
What does that mean? Can't you just move on, fall in love with someone, and end it all? It was just two years, he desperately insisted. We have spent more years apart than together. A wave of bitter emotions seemed to engulf me. I am sorry, but I consider those two years important. I, Jesus, Austin, you were my first love. I fell in love with you. You loved me when I wasn't sure what to do with myself and my body. How could I ever forget about those years, few as they were? You could find someone, he suggested. I tried, I replied, and threw my hands in the air. It didn't work out. You said you have a boyfriend. I lied, that's what I did. The last time I had a boyfriend, it was a mess. I wasn't sure why he was suddenly talking about it, but that didn't mean all the right and wrong emotions didn't engulf me. In fact, I was drowning in them. If, if Austin kissed me right now, I let him do whatever he wanted with me. Why are you always in my face? I pointed at him. You approached me. I didn't do anything. Right. He muttered bitterly. I told Emily about you. About us. The past. The confession shocked me. She's a good friend, and I couldn't hide it from her. All right. I said, surprised at how stable I sounded. What do you want? I don't know. He asked. Whenever I am near you, I either want to punch you or... He stopped and looked away. Or kiss you. The blood seemed to rush to my head. What? He shook his head. You should have punched me when I broke up with you. I scoffed. People in love do not hit each other. Yeah, but I left you when you needed me. My dad had died only two weeks before when Austin had broken up with me. It was terrible timing, sure, and... I even resented him for it, but I never held on to it. He looked down at his hands. It was still raining outside, so I almost missed the next words he said. I closed my car door and looked at him again. What? I asked. Can I kiss you? We are on college campus, I reminded him. You didn't say no. He said. No, I didn't. Austin was smaller than me. So it was easy to maneuver him into the car, and that was how we ended up kissing on my back seat. Austin was at my place, and we were sitting at the far ends of the couch. There was a movie playing on the television, one of the subjects from the ongoing seminar, but neither he nor I were paying attention. The seminar was two days from now on, and we had to prepare our questions and be ready for whatever the students were going to discuss. And here we were, the professors, distracted. Please don't tell me you regret that kiss, I said softly. I don't, he answered. I'm wondering about something else. What? I lowered the volume. It was basically on mute by now. You know, the breakup was useless. My dad found out about us a few weeks later. He looked at me when I asked why he didn't tell me. I couldn't, he replied. He found out, and he didn't want us to meet. I knew that money, Felix. As stupid as it sounds now, if it wasn't for his money, I wouldn't ever have become a professor. I wouldn't have ever kissed you after all these years. Right, I replied. It will sound so stupid, but I hated you for not getting the hint. I knew it made no sense, but I still hoped that you'd know everything without me ever telling you. It doesn't. He nodded. Now I am no longer that kid. I earn good money live in my own place, meet my parents once or twice a month, and that's it. They focus on Sarah more than they do on me. She is practically their burden, and I hate to say that, but I am also glad she has taken that attention from me. Sarah was Austin's older sister and currently paralyzed. The doctor said she would remain the same as long as she lived. Austin had once told us that that wouldn't be too long. So what are you wondering about? I am going to tell them. I don't want to marry Emily. Okay, I said. Some weight seemed to lift off my shoulders. He shrugged. I cannot put all the responsibility on her shoulders. That's kind of you, I replied, a little distracted. Felix, he said suddenly. I know things are messy right now, and that it has been years. But would you like to, I, I don't know, hang out or something? Like a date, just between us. 
I am 37, Austin. I will celebrate my 38th birthday in two weeks, I replied. You cannot expect me to be your secret. Right, he replied and licked his lips. Give me some time. I had given him 15 years. I sighed and increased the volume. Let's watch it. How about we start from somewhere? He suggested again. Like, from where? Maybe you can help me with my paper. I am stuck somewhere. A laugh rushed out of my mouth. That's so romantic of you. He flushed a shade of red. I mean, come on, I am a professor. That's my love language. He kept his eyes on me, even though I'd pull my eyes away from him. So would you like to begin from there? I was happy, but I was also afraid if this would work out. I wondered if I still loved him, because I had fallen in love with him all those years ago, or that I never fell out of love with him. We can try, I replied, keeping my cool. Definitely. So, can I kiss you? You can kiss me, yes. And so he did. One of the nights in the next few weeks, I wondered if things between Austin and me were going too fast. We had spent too long away from each other, resenting each other, putting each other down, and I always wondered that all those years would never let it work out between us. But that didn't mean things looked hopeless between us. A week after the so-called movie night, Austin informed me over the phone that he talked to his parents about his situation with Emily. He told them that he didn't want to marry her, and that he was quite sure he wasn't straight. Then, in a surprised tone, he continued, I was expecting the worst, honestly, but all they did was to calmly ask me to leave them alone, and to not show them my face. I couldn't help but laugh in reply, and Austin found that funny, too. It's insane, he continued. They want me to follow their rules even now. Well, I had replied, you set the standards too high with me. Austin's case was of the classic kind. It often reminded me of the conversations I had with my students about gender and sexuality, and how passionate some of them seemed, whether they supported or hated anyone who didn't feel straight. But he had grown. He was in his late thirties, and he insisted that it was time that he took responsibility for his life and decisions. He couldn't spend his entire life blaming his parents for everything. Now we ate lunch together. Sometimes one of our colleagues would raise their eyebrows and ask why we didn't look like we wanted to run over each other with our cars. I believed it was because we wanted to act like adults. The competition between us seemed childish now. During one of these lunches, Austin suggested we work on a paper together. Imagine that. You can bring your perspectives and I can bring my own. How about you finish the one you're currently working on? Right. He murmured, clearly embarrassed. I am right here if you need me. Thanks. He replied. I sipped on my coffee and looked at him for a minute or two in silence. What's the update on your syllabus? This seemed like a safe territory. Two chapters left. He replied. They don't really seem to understand Camus, though. I am worried we are going to be stuck there for a while. I cringed. I agreed Camus needed some serious understanding of absurdism. Where are you? He asked. One chapter. They don't like it at all. Which one? Oh, let me guess. Is it Simulacra? You got it. But that's easy. For you and me, yes. Not for them, though. He laughed and returned to his lunch. You know, I'm thinking of writing a book. A novel, to be exact. But yes... Oh, I replied. About what? Romance, he replied. Don't make that face. He glared at me and then softened his expression. I just, he sighed. Sometimes I cannot help but think that I never properly apologized to you, Felix. You were young, I replied, even though it was painful. You were young too, he pointed out. Right, I couldn't argue there. So, this novel will be an apology. I hope so. I smiled at him. I would love to read it. I know you will. Austin's return to my life wasn't entirely shocking or surprising. There was a reason that I always felt there were similar patterns in the ways we interacted now. We spent so much time thinking about each other, even before the announcement he made, that it never really looked like we'd move on from each other. 
The only difference was that we displayed that in an unusual way, by competing against each other. Thankfully, despite spending so many weeks closer than we'd done in ages, things were only limited to kissing and talking. And oh, we talked so much. Austin often mentioned he had a lot of catching up to do, and I agreed. So that was where we spent and invested most of our time. One day, his parents called to inform him of Sarah's death. The funeral was held, and Austin asked me to come with him. An argument broke out between Austin and his parents, and he replied that he was happy for his sister that she escaped their parents' prison. She was surely in a good place, he told them before he left. That night, it rained again. We were on our way to my home when he asked me to swirl the car to his parents' place. I want to do something, he said. Okay, I replied, and did what was asked of me. It was a 30-minute drive to his parents' place. He asked me to park the car in front of his parents' home. He sat there in silence. It was raining heavily, and it was getting dark. Is everything all right? I asked. He nodded and kept looking at the closed door of his parents' home. The lights were on in their bedroom, he mentioned. It's on in Sarah's, too. They are her parents, after all, I replied. They're mourning, Austin. They should have cared for her when she was well and kicking. He scoffed. His eyes sparked when he noticed the familiar figure of his mother moving up and down the bedroom. Felix, he said, and turned to me. Yes? Can I kiss you? I sadly looked into his eyes. Is it to prove something to your parents? He shook his head. I want to move away from their hold. He said, Kissing you will prove to me that I am perfectly capable of making decisions. You are, I replied. I know, but can I kiss you? I smiled with a sigh. Of course you can kiss me, Austin. And just like that, like all those years ago, he clambered on my lap and kissed me. The lights were still on his parents' bedroom, and if they looked, we would be visible to them. Let's go on a date, official one, he suggested, and pull back from the kiss. Uh, I said, unable to form a straight sentence. Let me bring you on a date. Let me make all the wrongs right. I breathed heavily. That would be nice, Austin. Right, he said, and leaned over. I held him around his waist kiss me then. And so I did. We did go on a date. It was in secret, but when I invited Austin to my parents' home, he accepted the request. When my mom saw him again, he said, I knew you'd come back together. And my dad replied, He has spent 15 years moping over you. Do not break his heart again, son. That night, as we lay on my bed, a little away from each other in fear that we'd do something that we weren't ready for, he confessed that he hoped his parents would turn like mine someday. He managed to publish his paper, and now started working on another, this time together. I would hope our efforts do not go to waste anymore. Have you ever seen a couple making their way back to each other after a long time? Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to become a part of our Rainbow Force, and to stay wholesome.